Hey everybody, this is Tim Chavez from Faith Matters. In this episode, we got to speak with Nylan McBain. Nylan's actually been on this podcast before in a conversation with Terrell Gibbons, where she talked more about her own background and faith journey. In this episode, we focused a little bit more on her work and its implications for us as members of the church and of a society that's striving to become more equal. Nylan is the founder of Better Days 2020 and has become a leader in speaking and writing about women's leadership and the U.S. suffrage movement, with a specific focus on Utah and the West's early role in that movement. Nylan previously founded another nonprofit, the Mormon Women Project, which changed the dialogue around Latter day Saint women in significant ways. In 2020, Nylan was named Extraordinary Woman of the Year by the YWCA of Utah. Her book, Pioneering the Vote, The Untold Story of Suffragists in Utah and the West, won the Freedoms Foundation National Award. She's also the author of the 2014 book, Women at Church, which we think is so important and informed much of our conversation. Nylan is a graduate of Yale University, mother to three daughters, and lives in Salt Lake City. She is absolutely fascinating, and we were really inspired by speaking with her. We hope that you enjoy the conversation as much as we did. Nyland McBain, we are so excited to have you in the studio. So thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Um, so not too long ago, you were on the Faith Matters podcast with Terrell Gibbons, and you guys got to really dive into your backstory and and the things that, that made you you. So we're going to just jump right in to women's issues in the church. And and if you're interested in, in Nyland's very interesting childhood and and growing up years, then you can go listen to the, the um, Terrell Gibbons episode. Um, but I would love to talk about the very first line of your book, which is now seven or eight years old now, Women at Church. Um, the intro to that book is something that I kept coming back to mind as we were preparing for this interview, um, because it sort of like sets up the parameters that I think I think a lot of people feel it's disarming to a lot of people, people who feel maybe uncomfortable about women's issues in the church, who feel like they're about to be, to feel threatened or, and they just, you know, they're not really sure where, where, um, what role they have to play in women's issues. I feel like the very first line of your book is, is really disarming and it feels like very uniting and something that like we can all get behind and decide to do together. So I'll just read this. It says, um, the, this book is predicated on the single belief that there is much more we can do to see hear, and include women at church. And, and then the rest of the book is basically an outline for what we can do without breaking big rules, but obvious, like, but, but things that should obviously be changed to make women more visible and, and more heard. So could you kind of just talk about those parameters a little bit and who your audience was for the work that you've done over the last seven to 10 years and, and, um, and just like what you hope that this book would accomplish? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, it has been seven or eight years and it's really interesting to sort of go back to that mindset where we were, where I was personally, you know, 10 years ago when I kind of started thinking about these issues and where the church was 10 years ago. And this book was very specifically written for an audience that, you know, as you mentioned, might not have wrestled with uh, women's place in the administrative church before. And by wrestled, I mean, um, thought deeply about it and also been bothered by it. Um, and and noticed the inequities and noticed the areas that, um, you know, perhaps we weren't thinking imaginatively enough about how women could participate in uh, church administration. And it was very specifically addressed to um, to present some of the arguments for, uh, that those who do uh, struggle and, and and wrestle with these issues, some of the some of the arguments that are important to them, and to introduce those arguments in a way that didn't threaten. I, lo- I love how you just said the the big rules, right? <laughs> um, but but really got us to think imaginatively and creatively uh, about why uh, some some female members of our, of the church uh, are in are in pain over the way that church administration is run. And what we can do about it, and so it was. It was a very deliberate uh, positioning of the book to that audience that might not have thought of these issues before, or that maybe had somebody in their family or in their close circle who were, and they just couldn't empathize with it. They didn't understand it. It wasn't their personal experience. So a lot of the book it was dedicated to sharing that personal experience and creating that empathy. In fact, the whole first part, per, first part of the book, and that was something that uh, that was a job that needed to be done ten years ago. Um, and of course, still needs to be done in many, many circles today. But uh, it's been a remarkable 10 years since I've been doing this uh, in terms of the the way we've seen our membership, at least here in the United States, uh, shift and and sort of soften itself to these discussions. Yeah. 
Would you talk about your newest book, Pioneering the Vote? Because in some ways it felt like a little bit of an extension. To, you were It was a new way to honor women's voices, and these were specifically women's voices of the past. So would you talk about why that matters so much and, and what your intention is with this, this, this book that just came out? Yes. So I have had the privilege of spending the past four years, since about uh, 2006, summer of 2016, end of 2016, um, studying the role of Utah women and uh, almost by definition than Latter-day Saint women had in the women's advocacy movement of the 19th century. And we know that movement mostly by the suffrage movement or the, the, the effort to uh, give women the right to vote in political elections. And uh, unfortunately, 2020, uh, the celebrations that we had <laughs> planned were, um, were mostly sort of dimmed, but we, we were really able over the past four years to build a movement here in Utah to celebrate the fact that it was actually a Utah woman who was the first American woman to cast a legal ballot in the United States. And that happened on February 14th, 1870. Um, and so in February of 2020, we were able to celebrate the 150th anniversary of that first female vote. And then um, in August of 2020, the nation celebrated the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which expanded women's voting rights to uh, the rest of the nation. And so that was a significant anniversary as well. And so we put together this amazing campaign around um, education and the arts and events, uh, public art uh, and you know, multiple publications to really educate Utah about the role that, that our women had in the 19th century. And, you know, this, the project was founded by, you know, myself and another LDS woman. And so we were particularly interested in the role that uh, the, the pioneer women here um, played in this in this movement in the 19th century. Um, the organization we created, Better Days 2020, was non-denominational and focused on all of Utah history and all of our communities in Utah, which are very rich. But, you know, personally for me, my, my interests always came back to this idea that it was um, some of our female church leaders, some of our male church leaders, some of the female pioneers of our early days here in the Utah uh, in Utah Territory, who actually were leading the nation in this massive, multi generational, you know, seventy five year campaign to give women um, political equality and civic civic equality. And so, when we discovered the leadership of LDS women in that movement, it was just like this light bulb went off for me personally. You know, I I couldn't believe I didn't know this history before. I wasn't raised in Utah, so I didn't go to Utah history classes, you know, in elementary or high school or anything like that. But I thought, surely, as like, you know, an, a, an LDS girl growing up anywhere in the world, I should know this remarkable history of my people. But it had really been buried, and um, so it was an absolute joy to kind of uncover that. And one of the ways that I uncovered that by was by writing another book called Pioneering the Vote, The Untold Story of Suffragists in Utah and the West. And um, that was published by Shadow Mountain. And it was really a chance to tell the whole story of um, Utah women and, and by, by definition, LDS women's leadership in that movement. Um, I mean, you know, by definition, that story of 19th century LDS women is a story of polygamy. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you know, it was kind of daunting to, to know I was going to write a book about polygamy. But polygamy was was in, you know, completely intertwined with the suffrage movement and with Latter-day Saint women's efforts to gain their political autonomy. So it was an absolute necessity to really lay on the table how those two things were intertwined, to, to wrestle with the complexity of that, the dysfunction of plural marriage, um, the silver linings of plural marriage uh, that these women experienced. And so, yeah, it was a fascinating experience. And um, I, I love, I love these women that I got those years to study. So yeah. uh, I can tell you as someone that did grow up in Utah and took Utah history classes, I also did not, <laughs> also I also did, did not, not know that. Right. <laughs> um, but I'm, it sort of raises the question a little bit, just and from a lay, lay person's point of view that's not done a lot of study on this, it, it appears you know that what was happening during that long period that sort of sort of culminated uh, in 1870 uh, that that's a very uh, that's a very progressive movement, right? And uh, at least uh, at least uh, like I said, from from a maybe sort of simplistic perspective, you could argue, or and I know that critics would argue that over the next 150 years there was a, not a whole lot of progressivism when it when it comes to women's issues specifically in the church or in Utah, so. Uh, so just from uh, just from that perspective, 
and obviously there's a lot more nuance to it, but it's sort of like a what happened, you know? Do you? Do you that, that's I, I know. The how do you reconcile? How do you reconcile <laughs> that's that? That's the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, over the past several years, as I've presented this information to many, many people, that's the question everybody asks, whether they're members of the church or not, um, because I think anything anybody that knows anything about the current. Uh, sort of gender conversations and the church looks at the story and, and asks what happened. And it's a, it's, um, it, it's a fascinating, fascinating pendulum sw swing. And I, I won't go into all of my theories here today, but, but, um, it was a, it was a gradual, uh, decline in women's autonomy and in the role that they played within the institutional church. Um, milestones along that journey were, for instance, the ending of the Exponent magazine, the, the ending of the Relief Society magazine, the re removal of Relief Society budget from their own autonomous control, the um, the moving of the welfare department from the Relief Society into the un under correlation, the priesthood department, et cetera. Um, and so it's a, I mean, you can look at the hundred year history from really, um, you know, 1920 to today and, m and map out that pendulum swing. Um, and so, you know, it, when I was writing women at church, actually, you know, when I was starting off in these conversations, I had older women come to me and sort of write me emails or come up to me privately and say, you know, it wasn't always like this. Wow. Mm -hmm. I remember growing up when my mother was responsible for the Relief Society budget and we would have bazaars to sell things to, you know, boost the Relief Society budget so that we could do our own projects. I remember my mother being, someone one woman told me, I remember my mother being on the Relief Society general board and she would travel around with general authorities to speak to people at their state conferences, et cetera, you know, and now, you know, general board mem members don't have the same responsibilities that they used to. Um, you know, you see Emmeline Wells, who's of course my personal hero and the, and the, the main protagonist of Pioneering the Vote and the main suffrage leader here in Utah, and among the the church, um, you know, she was the first General Relief Society president to be released before her death. Uh, all General Relief Society presidents up until that point had uh, the equivalent of a prophet's calling. They were called until death. They had a, an office, you know, in the church administration building with the um, with the male leaders. And she was the first who was moved out of that building into the bishop's building. Um, given a new line of reporting and also released before her death. So you can you can map it along um, that continuum for about a hundred years from about 1920 to where where we are today. Um, and that's and that's a fast it's a fascinating question, right? Because my theory um, looks at the suffrage movement and says this is the way Latter-day Saint women were participating in the church institution. You really mm -hmm. can't separate the suffrage movement from, the church institution in that late 19th century Utah history. Um, they felt like they were needed. They felt like it was the building of the kingdom. They felt like it was a part of the restoration that they were working on. And so while men were, were still technically leading um, church decisions and church administration, they had this huge movement that gave them purpose and that gave them the opportunity to organize, to educate themselves, to gather, to petition, right? To have a voice on the public on, and national, you know, uh, stages. Um, and so and so when the suffrage movement, when they were no longer needed in the suffrage movement because of the, you know, culmination of the 19th Amendment or just some of the, the developments of the 20th century, um, the Relief Society as an organization and women generally in the church kind of lost lost their purpose. Mm. They lost, um, you know, the, the thing that had given them definition as Latter-day Saint women up until that point. That's really interesting. So one thing that was really challenging for me about this book was this idea that, so I think for the last couple of decades as a church community, we've really been wrestling with the ugliest parts of our history, like really coming to grips with that and learning about it and figuring out how to, how to fit that into our narrative. And so what actually ironically felt especially challenging for me was this idea that we have to believe the voices of these women from our history. And if they say that these plural marriages were expressions of their faith, or if they say that this gave them some sort of status that made them more able to accomplish their mission, that who are we to question their experience? And and I feel resistant to that. I feel like I want to say I I know better and I want to throw it all out and say this was there there are parts of 
this polygamy experience that were very coercive or oppressive and it's easier to kind of like feel galvanized by that thought and so it was really challenging to kind of open my mind up a little bit and say how was Emmeline Wells you know how did this contribute to her the amplification of her voice yeah so would you talk about just yeah. like negotiating that because Absolutely. that was actually like the hardest part for me about this book yeah and i think it is for everyone i you know as i said earlier i knew in writing this book that i was going to write a book about plural marriage and uh, you know how was going to how was i going to handle that i think you know the 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 very natural reaction that you're having is the reason these women's stories have been silenced for so many generations I, Totally because agree with that. Um, you know we've been embarrassed by it. We haven't mm -hmm. known what to do with it. We, you know, and this was this 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 reaction was alive and well in the time of Emmeline B. Wells. You know, part part of the right. whole sort of um, tr one of the tropes in the book is this idea that even though the Mormon women here in Utah were voting you know, decades before other American women, they were still being rejected by the national suffrage movements because the national suffrage leaders didn't know what to make of the fact that it was these polygamous wives that were doing what no other American women were doing. And it was Susan B. Anthony who rose up as such a hero for the Mormon women because she was the one who would, you know, physically invite them onto stage and put her arm around them and say, you know, I don't think any kind of marriage is good. So I don't right. care if these women are married to one man or one man's married to, you know, multiple men or whatever. She's like, they're doing what we're trying to do. So let's learn from them. And not all of the leaders felt that way because there was this just this disgust and this antagonism towards it even in that that day. Um, but I think as a, as a church, we've been complicit in silencing that history. And so we haven't let these women's voices uh, ring out. And the truth of the matter is they did much of their political activism in that in, in that time, uh, with the, in the effort to preserve and defend right. plural marriage as a way of life, and we can say more broadly, it was an effort to defend religious liberty. Right, there were lots of things tied up in it. It was the opportunity for Utah Territory to govern itself. It was the opportunity for the church to manage its own finances. Right, it was the opportunity to de to defend our own our own territory and all all of that, all of the states' rights, states versus federal rights. I mean, that it really came to a head when, with, with polygamy, but there were all sorts of other, um, you know, uh, sort of policies and, and political conversations wrapped up in that as well. But um, but yes, that is that's been for, you know, 100 plus years, that's been the reaction. And so so in, when writing this book, I, I wanted to make it clear that there was nothing about the institution of plural marriage that liberated these women. What liberated these women was their own initiative and what they did with the circumstances they found themselves in, right? And that's the silver lining in the story. Uh, I think what you're, what you're referring to is the fact that, you know, many of the protagonists in this, in this, this story um, – you know, we're able to do what they did for the benefit of American women everywhere because they were in plural marriages. And that's, I think, an angle that we haven't explored before when when talking about polyg polygamy as a church. And again, I want to make sure I'm clear that it wasn't the institution that allowed them to do right. it. It was the fact that, you know, in late 19th century America, uh, you know, somebody had to take care of the domestic duties. And if you had another woman at home to do that, that freed you up to go get multiple degrees like Martha Hughes Cannon did, right? Or to write thousands of editorials and run a newspaper like Emmeline Wells did, or open up a hospital like Ellis Ship, or you know, be a be a midwife to to that delivering thousands of babies and to, you know, developing those those national reputations that these women had was in part because they didn't have to tend to the traditional 19th century American woman's domestic duties. Um, and so, but they, they did that. They chose, and, you know, just as many women as did that were also completely trapped by, by plural marriage, right. right? It was entirely dysfunctional. Martha Hughes Cannon is the, the, the poster child of how complicated the system was. She was the first female state senator elected anywhere in the nation. She ran against her husband in the race in 1896. Uh, she was Angus Cannon's fourth wife, um, beat him, and uh, then during her time in the legislature, pioneered all sorts of wonderful health initiatives, um, public public safety and health initiatives that have been, you know, echoed around the country since then. But she also got pregnant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was in post-manifesto days. And so she was technically unmarried, right? Because she had been declared illegitimate Her and all the children under polygamy had been declared bastardized unless the husband claimed them from the wife he chose, right? 
So you had 60,000 women and children declared illegitimate or bastardized with the end of polygamy, and she was one of them. And so when she ended up being pregnant during her time in the legislature, it made the front page of the New York Times. I mean, it was a huge scandal. So she had to go into hiding in California to deliver her baby, and, and she she ended her political career. And, you know, she's famous for quipping that being a plural wife is so much easier than being a monogamous wife because you only have to be a wife for one week out of every month, <laughs> which is great. But she also burned all her letters and papers before she died oh, because wow. it was just the most excruciating existence for her. Um, and so I think that's what I really hope to convey in the way that I present plural marriage in the book is that, you know, these women were living in a desperately lonely situation, but they, out of their own initiative and also out of the support that they received from church finances and church members were able to go do remarkable things um, like get education and and speak out. Right. So yeah. I'm curious if in this uh, this story that you tell in the book, if there were um, if there were men who sort of played supporting roles or were allies, and I don't need that to be the narrative, by the way, I, and I don't want to remove the spotlight from the women who are the heroes of this story, but I'm trying to draw a corollary a little bit and say, you know, if if back then, you know, it was it was really just the women who were who were uh, making this progressive change, then you know, potentially, I guess I'm seeing a danger of men sitting back and saying, yeah, this is a women's issue. You know, let women let women take the lead here, and I don't feel comfortable with that necessarily. I'm so glad you asked that because it's actually one of my favorite parts of the Utah story is the fact that it was different than the rest of the nation when it came to the way men understood and supported this movement. Um, the 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 LDS church leaders at the time were entirely supportive of this. They understood that, you know, kind of in in the sense of the restoration, you know, generally all, you know, that this tide was going to lift all boats. Whereas in a lot of other places in the country, it was seen as a power grab by women in a zero sum game, right? If the women mm -hmm. gain power, then the men are going to lose power. And it was very threatening. And so um, you did have mostly men who were anti-suffragists in the broader American culture. You did have a lot of women who were anti-suffragists, of course, too. There's a reason it took 75 years to pass right. the 19th Amendment, right? But within the LDS community here in Utah, I mean, you have um, you have general authorities and future prophets who are saying remarkable things. For instance, Joseph F. Smith, before he becomes a prophet in this time and around 1895, he says uh, he encourages women to throw off the chains of their imprisonment. He says they're they're fondling their shackles, um, and that they're it's a it's a crime to pay a woman less than a man for for doing the same job. You have Franklin Richards um, saying that that. Uh, this this women's advocacy was going to be the brightest and glorious ray of Utah's shining star and that it was going to be an example to all the other states and territories. Wow. You have Orson F. Whitney saying that uh, gender equality was going to be the great lever by which the Almighty is lifting up this fallen world. You know, so so a lot of really uh, and, and then, of course, it comes down to historically it comes down to whether suffrage will be included in the Utah state constitution or not. And it is. Um, if you've read the book, you, we, you can contact me later about B.H. Roberts because <laughs> we have a beef with him. But okay. um, uh, but yes, I mean, it's it, Utah becomes the third state to enfranchise its women in their state constitution due exclusively to male voting delegates at the constitutional convention. So it's a it's a great part of the story. Yeah, that's amazing. So. This thing that you said about there were women anti-suffragists too. I I thought that was actually one of the most interesting parts in in um, women at church was you talked about um, women giving giving blessings, giving healing blessings, and something I had never I'd never looked into was how that practice ended, and it was so interesting that kind of it just sort of fell out of fashion. It was like the women kind of just stopped doing it, and then eventually it was officially ended. But it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't like somebody came in and and said, this is not allowed anymore. It was like, it just kind of became taboo and less and less common. And there was this idea that you should call the elders among the women too. And then it officially ended. So would you talk about how historically, are there any other examples where you've seen women sort of holding each other, holding each other down? <laughs> I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, he, like, he, the healing blessings are really fascinating place to start because, you know, you it's, it's, um, it's a really great example of how sort of American culture specifically dictates a lot of our practices within church culture um, because the doctrine was always there to, for women to perform healing blessings, but it was a post-World War II uh, 
uh, you know, kind of American culture, bring our bring our boys like, home. This is really late. Like yes, this yes, was yes. like in the forties. Oh yeah, like, no healing blessing. Women, to me. women performed healing blessings for over a hundred years, and now yeah. So like we it, think of this as like a pioneer thing. Yeah, but like, yeah, yeah. These are our grandmothers. Yeah, and and I mean, I'm sure there are women alive today who have done yeah. that, perform these blessings actively. Um, you know, when they were still sort of more normal and sanctioned, and especially. Um, I, I know they are. There are, in fact, I've I've spoken with many of them. And then the idea of, um, you know, women blessing a woman about to give birth, anointing for birth, mm -hmm. et cetera. So, but it's a really great segue into, you know, the modern day and what we're up against today. And, uh, you know, people always ask me, you know, the question you just asked asked me, uh, Tim, about the, the men, you know, assuming that it's, um, you know, men who are sort of holding women at church at arm's length and saying, I don't know if I want to touch this, you know, it's actually the opposite. Um, I, I've i always sort of said it's about four to one, the number of emails and comments and sort of personal communication I've received from men about this book, Wow. Um, as opposed to women. It's usually fathers, um, you know, it's of, of daughters who are raising daughters in the church uh, or they've had a wife struggle with this and she's never known where exactly to go. Um, meanwhile, anecdotally, uh, you know, one of the most common stories that I hear is from a man in authority, a bishop, a stake president, somebody in a calling who says, I reached out to my Relief Society presidency and I asked them to sit on the stand like you told me to, you know, um, and they refused. And I that story is legion. I hear it over and over and over again. And I have uh, and and I'm and I'm not I'm not suggesting that those women are trying to keep other women down, right? But mm -hmm. what I'm suggesting is that we don't have an expectation in the church with our current generations that women do participate in church administration, right? We don't. They're not raised to think, oh, I'm going to have to stay after and clean up chairs, or I'm going to have to come early and set up the sacrament, or I'm going to have to leave my family to go sit up on the stand because that's what we do as men, right? We've we've been, we've conflated church administrative duties so entirely with you know holding the priesthood as being a male mm -hmm. male priesthood authority power keys offices duties all of that has been so conflated and so exclusively um, you know sort of shoehorned into the male domain that that I think it feels unnatural and confusing for women to ask to be made to make sac simpler, similar sacrifices. And they are sacrifices. You know, when you have to leave your kids or your husband didn't go sit up on a stand, um, that's a sacrifice, right? You mm -hmm. like to fall asleep or tune out or check your phone when you're sitting in the pew. You can't do that when you're sitting up in the stand. So I, I understand that. But I think so that's that's a process of of helping our women understand what what our leaders are really talking about in terms of priesthood these days, which is separating power and authority right. of the priesthood, which women hold in their callings from the duties of administrating ordinances, for instance. Um, and those things are separate and there's much more integration of women's responsibility when it comes to our uh, the way we exercise priesthood authority and power in our callings than I think we've thought of previously. And so that's a change for women in the church and it's it's uh, there's some growing pains that come with that yeah. yeah what do you say to women who who say that who say this is just it doesn't matter if i'm sitting on the stand like no one i'm not doing anything you know it's it's an inconvenience and it just it's it's just visual like why does it matter and i remember i think you mentioned this or, or mentioned somebody who wrote to you about when women began praying in general conference and how the thing that broke her heart was that there were so many comments about how about the indifference like this doesn't so what like it's a prayer and like why does it matter and so so what do you say to people who feel that way who feel like it just doesn't matter and it's more inconvenient so i'm not i don't want to go to the extra meeting or well sit on the and standard. Th that may not be the attitude either they may they may truly feel that the church is offering and i'm, I'm sort of making this right. up but like is giving them the space they need to like uh realize their full potential you know and i i, I would imagine that yeah i would imagine that, it, that there are some women who and again, I don't want to speak for women, but uh, who don't feel like it's that they're trying to avoid any re responsibility of any kind, but they feel like they, they are feel they're, they're fulfilling. Fun. Yeah, they're fulfilling yeah. their responsibilities and they're they're thriving as women in the church. Yeah. And so, how, I, yeah, same question. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I imagine you hear some of both of those, like, I don't have a problem with this. So, like, let's not do all these. Let's not add all of these extra burdens. 
because we're the, the doctrine is that there really is equality. So why does it matter? We we're living in an age of representation. I have three teenage daughters. When I presented at the Fair Mormon Conference in 2012 and started presenting some of my early ideas around this. And when I wrote the book in 2014, my daughters, had, my oldest had barely been baptized. I now have three teenagers. Um, they, they will come home from church and cry for an hour. Um, church is, is very difficult for them because um, they will go and um, to, they'll go to school, they'll go to any organization or club or social media outlet or artistic outlet, and they'll be and they'll see um, representation of themselves as girls and future women in those spheres. And they'll be told that they can do that, that they're strong, that they're capable, that they have that potential, that nothing is off limits to them, right? And that they are part of a brave new world in which those barriers have been torn down and isn't that glorious and they are and it is and they are the beneficiaries and recipients of you know a long legacy of women who have been fighting to tear down those barriers for generations and it's a it's the first time in the history of the world that these kinds of opportunities are open to girls and they're relishing them and they're seizing them and my daughters are among those um church is the only place they go the only community, the only voice, the only influence in their life where they are told they can't do something because they're girls. And when they go to sacrament meeting, it doesn't matter if I, as their mom, had a voice at ward council. They don't know that. They don't see that. They've never been to the temple. They've never had an initiatory performed by another woman. All they know is that when they go to sacrament meeting, there's anywhere from, you know, five to 14 men sitting up on the stand, passing the sacrament, blessing the sacrament. In my ward, you know, their dad is the organist. We often have a male chorister, right? So, so it's Tim. I, oh, Tim. Yes. I love, <laughs> I love organists. It's a great calling. And it, but my point is, you know, they'll sit there and they'll count how many men are involved mm. in the in the proceedings of sacrament meeting. If you have a high counselor and he's brought a male missionary with him, I mean, you can go through an entire mm. sacrament meeting without a single woman participating. And there's no thought given to that. You know, no, there are very few bishops and there bless them that there are because there are the, those, but there are a few bishops who who really try to weigh that out um, you know, and then we do things implicitly to ourselves. For instance, my bishop offers couples the opportunity to decide who's going to speak first. Has anybody oh, wow. ever taken him up on the opportunity to have the husband speak first? No, because we have this implicit expectation that the speakers go in order of ecclesiastical authority. You start with the youth speaker, then you go to the woman and you conclude with the man. Right. And um, those are those are messages that are just being heard and seen loud and clear by our girls. And so, you know, I think it, 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 the big change since um, the big change that I've experienced since women at church is is my conviction that there are many things that have to come from the very top down. You know, I I really wrestled with and and am very proud of the work that I did in helping us imagine the way we could manage things on the local level. But at the end of the day, we need to have, um, you know, President Nelson say, the Relief Society presidency has got to sit on the stand in sacrament meeting. They need to mm -hmm. switch off with the elders quorum in conducting our meetings, right? I'm not talking about who's presiding with the keys of, of the bishopric, right? But I'm talking about, get a woman up there to make the announcements, to welcome people, to announce the hymns. Like seeing our Relief Society president up there and the stewardship she has for over half of the ward is, a. It's. I mean, I, I don't think we can overstate how important that is for my three teenage daughters sitting there um, or having her sit up on the stand, having the, that presidency sit up on the stand during state conference or award conference or, um, you know, just, just having a concluding speaker be a woman um, and having that weight of that authority and that ecclesiastical um, sort of gravitas, uh, it, it's, it makes a huge, huge difference. It's almost unconscious too. It just feels but, like these are like sub, such unconscious things. And I love that. I think you also mentioned just looking to women for theological direction. Like how often do you hear a woman quoted or, or even just I remember you said something about people taking bathroom breaks during the women speakers mm -hmm. at general conference. And mm -hmm. like, that's such a funny little thing that is, that really does send a message. Like this is time to go hop up and get a snack because we're not going to get any like doctrine here. Yeah. And like what, I mean, it just makes you realize like how deep those, 
yeah. that has been like socialized into us. To, and and to that be. has really, that has changed a lot. I mean, if we're talking, if we're going to talk about things that have changed in the last 10 years since the book came out, um, that, that has changed a lot. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, you know, I try to listen to a conference talk every day in the car while I'm driving my kids around. And, um, you know, I try to balance out a woman's talk and a man's talk that we're listening to. And it's impossible yeah. to find, um, you know, a a, a a a collection of more than just one or two women's talks that are not about gender roles. First of all, you know, we have wonderful speakers, but often they'll talk about why, you know, um, how women participate in the priesthood or how gender roles have been perverted by the world, you know, et cetera. And I'm like, I just want a woman to just talk about the atonement, right? right. <laughs> and not reference the fact that she's a woman or that she's talking to a woman or that she's or responsible for children yeah. or as, yeah. right. Um, and, you know, we have fantastic speakers among our female leadership right now and, and have had for, for the last 10 years. And, um, and they've been, you know, I think they've been given more of a voice, of course, than we get to, well, we just need sheer, sheer numbers. We just need more of them. We need them to speak more often in conference. We need those boards to get out there and be sharing really powerful doctrinal messages. You know, uh, the, the primary release society and young women's boards, you know, we've got phenomenal women on those boards and, uh, I think we're craving to hear from them as 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 ecclesiastical and as pastoral authorities. So yeah. just like Aubrey, I really appreciated the approach you uh, took in Women at Church, where you where you kind of laid out what we can what we can do within our sphere of influence, right? Sort of right here, right now, especially at the local level. But it raised the question for me, too, if it's OK, if you see it as OK to advocate ad advocate for changes that sort of rise above our station a little bit. And this is maybe something that has uh, changed over the, you know, roughly 200 years that the church has been around too. But if, I think there's a uh, culturally, at least right now, uh, sort of a feeling that it is not, it is not okay to make, to advocate for something that's church-wide, policy-wide, especially doctrine, completely off limits, you know? And so like, how do you, how do you, see, how do you see that? And how, is there, is there a, a way to approach approach those bigger those bigger changes or is it just it just is it just a waiting game yeah I, I i think you know one of the one of the common stories i've had since publishing women at church is people who have tried different things that are in the book and also things that they thought of on their own and one of the examples of those is the calling of a a, a sort of a, a a third counselor in the bishopric, and I've had a couple of bishops and stake presidents reach out to me and say that they've they've done this. Some have done it with more success than others. Some have been slapped on the wrist, and others have actually managed it quite well. And um, there, I'm thinking one more ward in particular that has uh, a female. Uh, I think what do they call a bishopric advisor or something like that, who's responsible mm. for planning all the sacrament meetings. Um, and I think they had her getting up and actually announcing the programs at the beginning of sacrament meeting too. So, you know, I, th I know things are things like that have been tried with varying degrees of 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 getting away with it, <laughs> right. right? Depending on who your local leaders are, et cetera. But but I think, you know, the general message of the book is that um, when it comes to programs in the church, most of the programs we're familiar with started as grassroots efforts. Um, you know, primary, seminary, et cetera, uh, family home evening. And um, and that our leaders are um, open to those ideas and historically have been open to those ideas, right? Um, and we have programs in the church today that are still being tested. You know, Just Serve, for instance, um, has been around for 10 years and still being, you know, tested and seeing how it works best for our membership, et cetera. I think we've, tr we've tried a lot of things with missionary department, missionary program, et cetera. So I think one of the messages of the book is not to be afraid of, of, of programs that are come up from the ground level. Um, you know, we haven't had as many examples of that since correlation and since a global church that's harder to do now than it was certainly at the beginning of the 20th century, for instance. Um, but then the other part of the question, of course, is around doctrine, right? And and I just think if we take the restoration at its face value, and if we truly, truly trust uh, that the, trust, the restoration is a continuing process, then we shouldn't be shoehorning eternal truths into 1830s gender norms, right? I mean, Joseph himself was challenging the 18. 40s gender norms by the time he got to Nauvoo with the starting of the Relief Society. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of speculation about what he would have done with the Relief Society if he, if he hadn't died, right? He was starting to create that parallel priestesshood 
um, not only in the power and authority that the priesthood offers, but also in the duties and offices that the priesthood offers, right? And his life was cut short and we don't know what he would have done with that. But, but you know, I think that, and then, you know, that I think we can look at that example and we can look at the example of, of the suffrage movement to say, you know, these, these ancestors who we revere and we love and we look back to in so many ways, we're challenging the gender norms of their time. And so we can be on the cutting edge of that too. Um, and instead, you know, we've, we've been on the trailing edge of that. I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that I think opens the door to doctrine discussions is this idea of reading scripture a little bit differently, um, specifically in the Doctrine and Covenants. I'm teaching Sunday school in my word. And the Doctrine and Covenants can be a challenge to a lot of women because it's the book in our canon that actually mentions women the least. They're the least women number of women named. The female pronouns are almost never used, right? Um, and you have entire sections like section 20 and section 107 that are exclusively about male responsibilities in church administration. And that's really hard for a lot of women. But, um, but you know, I think one of the things that I've been looking at recently in this particular study of the Doctrine and Covenants this time around is this idea of how we treat pronouns in English. You know, there's this idea that that women just automatically need to translate men, mankind, he, mm -hmm. you know, him into gender neutral days when they're reading it and applying scriptures to themselves. Right. And nobody ever really talks about that. But that's like that's like a mental exercise that women mm -hmm. are expected to do oh, for sure. all the time. Right. Um, but when do we when do when are we supposed to do that and see ourselves and see the general they and when is it truly exclusively him, he, a man? When when it comes to sections around priesthood offices and duties, we say, oh, no, 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 you're not supposed to translate that to they, or you're not supposed to translate that to she or her, or you as a mm -hmm. woman. That is just a man. But then in many other sections and in many other doctrines, we say, oh, when they say mankind, that 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 means you women. Wow, you know? this is a fascinating point, yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, it, I've actually started going section by section and you have, you have to, and you see how instinctively we do that. Oh, this section, men is, men is men. In this section, men is people. Um, and I think, you know, when you start reading the Doctrine and Covenants that, in that way, you're like, well, why? Why do I have to do that? And then there's some things in... For instance, in um, section 20, verse 58, where it's talking about the duties and responsibilities of deacons and priests, it says, ex it says explicitly, deacons and priests do not have authority to administer the sacrament. Uh, sorry, teachers. Sorry, deacons and teachers. <laughs> Hold sorry. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deacons and teachers do not have the authority to administer the sacrament. Only priests have the authority to administer the sacrament. It makes that very clear in section 20. So then you're like, well, why are deacons and teachers passing the sacrament? If they're not allowed to administer, then administer only means say the prayer, right? So what's so special about carrying it from the table to the pew if they're not allowed to administer it. And then why can girls pass it down the pew, but not to the pew, mm. you know? So anyway, <laughs> I, I, so I just, the point is um, just to just to think more, more creatively. creatively. That's not subversive. I don't think that's subversive. I think that's just reading and challenging and studying scripture to how it applies to us and asking questions and not taking things on face value. And could you talk about just the practicality of that though? Like where where do you ask those questions? And with, with <laughs> uh, whom? <laughs> that's a really good question. I just I you know, I just exist in the you theoretical. Just sit on the front row. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, sounds good. Um, at least on our podcast we yeah, can talk about yeah, that. Exactly. At least here we're talking yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. I when you, I think you bring up crucial conversations in women at church. Mm -hmm. And this was I thought actually this is a really helpful section. You talk about how you can talk about almost anything with almost anyone if you make them feel safe. So maybe that's maybe that's where we can go with this. Like how do you talk to a leader about making changes that that do feel like imaginative and creative and that would help women be more seen and heard and useful without making a leader feel threatened? So one of the mantras that I have in doing this work um and it doesn't matter if it's actually true or not, but one of my belief statements is that there are no villains. Mm -hmm. Meaning there that nobody's out to really get us, right? They're not, the, the, I think there are very few people who truly are out to make people feel uncomfortable or to, um, you know, get a secure their hold on their power or uh, put others down, et cetera. So I, I think, you know, I've always tried to, to just assume the best of people that, that, that it's about weighing 
um, different parts of, of our uh, policies and practices and doctrines. Some people, you know, may hold on to one element more than, and that's what the that's what the sort of cover of the book at Women at Church is about. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we have all sorts of paradoxes in our in our in our gospel practice, right? We have uh, obedience versus free agency being the most obvious one, right? Um, we have love and acceptance balanced against keeping the commandments, right? And um, repentance. Uh, versus um, inclusion, right? Or, you know, so you have all of these sort of paradoxes and, and things that we have to balance. And I think most of the disagreements come when people are just prioritizing different things. You know, I'm, I'm prioritizing um, uh, this this idea of, of a big, big tent membership, right? Where there is room for uh, everyone, no matter what your familial status, right? No matter what your level of of, of faith, or, et cetera. But um, but that may mean that for someone who really wants to prioritize um, adherence to the letter of the law or the word of the doctrine and covenants, right? Mm -hmm. um, some of those things might be in conflict. And so I think for me, it's always about seeing what is this person trying to prioritize and, and how are they trying to move the kingdom forward in the way that they think is most important. And um, and so, you know, reading the Doctrine and Covenants, for instance, in the way that I just described is an example of that. We're saying, OK, I'm you know, you can you can on the one hand, you can balance the, the, the strict observance in the way we've always done it or within our lived experiences within our lifetimes with this sort of sense of, you know, early. Joseph Smith restorationist imagination mm -hmm. where he was challenging everything. And I, I like to think that maybe that's kind of what I'm prioritizing, um, looking for ways that we can continue this exploration of this, you know, marvelous restoration that we're a part of. So I, I, I think that's the exercise that I try to, to go through, um, you know, subconsciously when I'm having these conversations. I really love that because then it keeps you out of believing that this is a zero sum thing, that you're it's a win or a loss, that maybe we have gifts and we have passions and and causes and things that are important to us. And and if I, I like the idea that when they're authentic, that can be a gift for our community no matter where that puts you on this spectrum. And yeah. and I just love that. That's like a really generous way to see your leader and probably results in a lot more cooperation than it does otherwise. Yeah. You know, especially when someone is is explicitly in power. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's not going to be revolutionary, but I, I think the other major point is, of course, to always personalize it. Right. I mean, for me right now, in my lived experience, uh, the gender um, the the gender practices in the church are not sustainable for my children. For my three daughters, they are not sustainable. Um, and, you know, we could say okay, if we're prioritizing sort of this is the way it is and we need to be obedient, we could say maybe there isn't room for them in this church then, right. you know. I've had, I've, I've, I've thought that. Maybe there isn't going to be room for my daughters in this church. Um, if they're not able to take off the gender lens um, and see the, the broader beauty of the gospel, which is a very tall order, and I understand that, and some people are not going to be able to do that, right? If they're not able to do that, um, is there a place for them here? And you know, if I if 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 I say to a leader, you know, I'm doing this because I want my daughters to be able to remain in the covenant for their whole life under the ceiling that my husband and I have, that they will be able to perpetuate that with their own spouses and their own children, and that's not going to happen the way things are right now. I I would hope that that's a pretty powerful statement. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a great point. Yeah. So, oh, sorry, were you going to say something? No, go ahead. Um, I was just going to, so we've talked a little bit about this this pendulum swing. Um, it seems that now, potential, so sort of like from the potentially radically progressive moment of women's suffrage, you know, swinging sort of all the way to the other side. And I'm not sure if you'd assign that a particular date, but it seems like maybe now we're getting a pendulum swing back a little yeah. bit more. Where where do you see us sort of in that, in that swing right now? And what do you hope for over the next decade or several decades? Yeah. Well, since we came back to this question, I'll, I'll kind of um, draw out my theory a little bit in more detail. Uh, I think, you know, when we're looking at the history of the suffrage movement, specifically in the 19th century Utah Territory, 
the church and the broader American culture were so at odds with each other, right? We were practicing plural marriage. We were running our own finances mm -hmm. and our own theocracy out here. We had this crazy leader who was like, you know, sending <laughs> the military, you know, <laughs> what, yeah, right? And and we were so at odds. And there was just this battle of, uh, like I said earlier, states' rights, religious freedom. Um, and, and, you know, we we spent decades trying to align ourselves with the broader American culture and with the federal government specifically, right? We, we suffered so much under those various legislation at the end of the 19th century that stripped the church of tax rights and, you know, all, criminalized polygamy and all these things that there was this effort at the beginning of the 20th century to kind of conform, right? Um, and to get back in the good graces of this country that we had escaped from as refugees um, in the 1840s. And so that, in my in my mind, in my historical understanding, culminates uh, in the 1950s when the Tabernacle Choir sings at Mount Rushmore for a broadcast. And I think I talk about this in, in Women at Church. Um, you know, President Monson was alive at that moment, for instance, and and, Amer and the Tabernacle Choir was dubbed America's Choir, right? And you have this post-World War II era where you know, men are being welcomed back home, back to the factories. The women are going back to their homes. And, and church culture beautifully connects with broader American culture. And so we just grab onto that. Mm -hmm. And we just, we're just like, we arrived. But yay, we right. were declaring victory. Um, but the world moves into the 1960s, right? And uh, the church does not. And so you have you have this kind of chiastic relationship between the the church and the world coming together and then coming together and then starting to diverge again. And I think that the divergence probably culminated in the 1990s. Um, probably, you know, we if you put a date on it, some would probably say the excommunication of the September 6th or mm -hmm. something like that, right? And so I, I definitely think that uh, the pendulum has started swinging back. And that's one of the things that's interesting about the last 10 years since I've been doing you know, thinking about this and doing this work and since Women at Church was written, we have seen um, you know, so much in the global church, both policies, practices, sort of cultural encouragement that um, is really much more in line with our global membership, right? And what the reality is for our global membership. Um, we have everything from you know conference talks and lots of conversations in, in women's conference, et cetera, about you know being a working mom and and we're not getting married, right? And we have such a huge population in our church that that are that are not married and addressing that and actually you know doing the work to make sure that they feel, um, you know, that that there's a place for them. And, and so I think good work is being done there. And then in terms of the policy side, we have uh, women, you know, going on missions earlier, which has changed the whole demographic of the mission labor force. We have women witnessing, which, of course, you know, is a, is a very it's one of those ways of reading scripture imaginatively of asking yourself, yeah. well, I mean, if that Mary, was something you brought up. Yeah, a long I, time I, ago. I yeah, I did. If Mary was the first one to see <laughs> Jesus, why can we not have? Right. Right. So, you know, I think um, lots of good things have happened. Um, our they that, you know, our leadership is looking at uh, the the voices of our our female leaders naming them differently, addressing them differently, having them speak uh, in, in different ways and broader ways and broader settings. So, um, you know, I think lots of lots of great things are happening. And so, yeah, I just I, like I said earlier, I think, um, you know, there have to be some things that come from the top now. Mm -hmm. um, it's obviously I hope people continue to take the message of women at church and explore things and try things on the local level. But um, when it comes to visibility and voice um, in the mainstream church, the, those are changes that really need to come from the top down. Okay, thank you so much. These are incredibly helpful. Are, um, where can we, where can readers find or, or listeners find more about you and what you're doing now, now that your big 2020 projects are over? <laughs> yeah, well, Pioneering the Vote is available at Desert Book and at Amazon and any bookshop. Um, so I encourage you to, to, to do that, you can follow Better Days 2020 on social media. Um, it's a, the organization is still doing wonderful things for you women in Utah and celebrating, you know, LDS women's heritage generally. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thank much, you so much, Marilyn. Thank you. Okay. Thanks as always for listening. And we really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Nyland McBain. You can find out more about her and her work at nylandmcbain.com. 
We also wanted to mention one thing we thought was really cool. As a part of the Better Days 2020 initiative, Nylan and her team worked with the state of Utah to get a women's suffrage recognition license plate approved, commemorating that Utah women were the first to vote under an equal suffrage law. We are currently sporting one on our family's car, and if you live in Utah and would like to find out how to get one, you can go to betterdays2020.com and click on license plate in the navigation menu. And as always, if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get a chance, we'd love for you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. It definitely helps get the word out about Faith Matters, and we really appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening. And as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.